Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well today. I am grateful for so many things about this church. I am grateful that we have uh, men and women who know the word, have lived the word, and teach the word, and we have many people here who do that. I'm grateful that we have people who are new, and perhaps you're here new this morning, and you don't know about Christianity, and you're wondering what church is all about. We're glad you're here. This is a good place for you. I'm glad we have older people. Uh, We're glad we have younger people. I'm glad we have a diversity in this church, because it's good for us to know that God continues to work His plan all time, through all places, and all people. And he invites us, encourages us to join together as we become more and more like him. This church, by the way, is centered on the word of God. And you can say amen right there. We're centered on the word of God. Because it is the power of God. It is the truth of God. And it can transform how we think. Through it, Jesus Christ is revealed by the Holy Spirit. We can know what is true. We can walk and follow after him And we can rejoice in him and look forward to seeing him where he makes all things new. But now, during this world, during this time, it's a little rough sometimes, right? And there's a lot going on. Sin does, um, let's see, reign in some degree for sure. But we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, before we go in this, I I just remembered, between services, by the way, at 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, We have a class that's uh, part of our security training class, and it's just for one hour. And this is open for anybody and everybody. If you are thinking, yep, I was going to go to that, it's going to happen in the fellowship hall. And what it's about is uh, equipping us to be aware of our surroundings and our situations so that we can perhaps be um, perceiving or be prepared for if there be any trouble of any sort. And so because we're in a fallen world, we need to be wise and hopefully prepared to make a difference and do what's right. So that's going to be for all of us in between the services today at 12 o'clock in the fellowship hall. So hopefully you already are still in your Bible. And as Rick did mention, this passage is um, powerful. It's potent. And it should be sobering to us. And I'm not necessarily concerned, I'm not primarily concerned for the people in this room today, the people who are online, people who are viewing this service afterwards. I'm most concerned for people who are not here. I'm most concerned for people who at some point said that they were a Christian, but they have not connected to Christ through his word or barely in prayer or nigh show up at a church or participate in it. We should collectively um, rejoice in God's calling people to himself as children and also not to be deceived as to who are children and who are not children. And so the Apostle John, who is our good pastor, our good friend, called by God, knew Jesus personally, gave his life uh, in service to Christ, wrote the gospel, and we're aware of that. And then he wrote these letters now to this church and to the church of all time, helping us to understand what it means to be a Christian. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, and we've been talking about these verses time and time again, these, these, these verses, or this verse, is the verse that we are viewing the whole entire letter through. It says this, I write these things to you who believe, okay? writing to the church, those who believe, in the name of the Son of God, which is Christ, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So John's purpose is informing and encouraging and making it clear for people of all time, and in particular the church, that we can have assurance of salvation, or we can be assured that we have eternal life that comes through Christ. Because at times, if you're like me, perhaps you have wondered about that. Am I truly a Christian? Do I truly know him? And I... hope that you think about these things. There are people at that time in that early church that were teaching things that were contrary to Scripture. 
Tom told us about this last week, and thank you for what you did last week. It was great, fantastic, okay? And so we look at these antichrists. You look at people who say they were a part of the church, but they weren't a part of the church, and they were speaking things that were deceptive and untrue about Christ, untrue about the grace of God, not scripturally sound. And so John, as a good father would do, as a good pastor would do, was telling the church what is true and and reminding us of the things that must be true of us so that we are assured that we are in Christ. And if you read these things, most of us will feel, uh, what's the word, Uh, at peace, be confident, and be um, well-founded that we know that we're following Christ. The title of this message, by the way, is Confident and Unashamed. That we would stand that way in front of Christ when He appears. And this is what John's goal is. But later on, he says, hey, 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 but I don't want you to be deceived. The unfortunate reality is that deceivers and Christian quote-unquote deceivers are still around today. Now you can watch whomever you want to watch as long as you watch on YouTube, right? We have lots of teachers, teachers. And so every time you listen to somebody, including this somebody, Make sure that what is being taught is in alignment with the scriptures. And that's an amen place, right? What does the word say? Because it doesn't matter what people say to a degree, okay? What matters most is what the word says. So this is why time and time and time and time and time and I don't have enough time why we talk about the importance of knowing the Word, right? Why we talk about, hey, it's good to be in the Bible. This is why we have classes to equip us and things that we can understand that we would grow in these things. So John tells us the truth. And these truths, again, are startling and they're helpful in both ways. And so, The verses that we have today, and these first two verses of John chapter 2, and then we're going to go into, of course, Rick read the passage in John chapter 3. These last two verses serve as, as a hinge, okay, that connects and expands the theme that we see in chapter 2 about the importance of remaining in Him, remaining in Christ. So it takes that theme and overlaps it with the importance of understanding our identity as children of God and what that means and what that looks like. So we're going to walk through these passages and there is a number of things we need to consider. And my prayer is that you would think about it. My prayer is that you will look at it. My prayer that it'll be like um, James talks about, that the word is like a mirror, that we will look to it and then see ourselves. And hopefully we will like what we see. And if not, then we have grace to make a change or make some changes. I'm going to talk about six different things, and I know it's a lot, but we're going to work through them. Number one, the first command in this passage, and all of these are going to start with the word continue, okay, continue. First one is to continue in Him, Him being Christ. So here we are, 1 John chapter 2, we're going to jump back in, starting with verse 28. John says, and now, dear children... Dear to him, and more importantly, dear to God. Continue in him. That's where I got the point. Continue in him. Why? So that when Christ appears, when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed. There's the title. Before him at his return, at his coming. So let's pause here. Now, dear children, okay, if you are, and John emphasizes it in the next chapter wholeheartedly, 
If you are a child of God, it is important that we continue in Him. Meaning that there is a continual connection to Christ. This is, again, based in Jesus' teaching in John chapter 15 about the vine and the branch. That when we make a commitment to Christ, that we continue to be connected to Him in following Him, in learning of Him, on talking to Him in prayer, and being obedient to His Word and His calling on us. Do you understand this? Okay, Continue, continue, continue. Starting in Christ is important. But what's more important is how you finish, right? That we continue in Christ. And John is just urging this of our congregation, of us, of the church. Continue in Him. It is right for us to do it. It's important for us to do it. It helps us to bear His fruit and shine for Him and have purpose in so many things. Continue in Him. And I can hear John as he wrote this down. And then he tells us why. So that when Christ appears, and by the way, he doesn't say if there. Did you check that, right? He didn't say, well, perhaps if he does, or when he gets around to it, or, you know, we think it's going to happen. It's none of that. <laughs> when Christ appears. I hope that hope is just um, seared into your consciousness and you understand that, that he will be returning. Right? He promised this. Our hope is in this. John knew this without a shadow of a doubt. He says, okay, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed in his presence before him. This, by the way, is kind of a military term in the Greek. Okay? I was not in the military. My father was in the military. My grandfather was in the military. So I understand some of these things. What he's saying is that when our um, superior officer, right, the General of all generals. Okay, this is the sense. When he appears and when we stand in front of him like soldiers, right? In front of our superior officer, we will stand confident that we finished what he asked us to do and continued in his mission. And unashamed knowing that we faithfully followed him and his orders and his heart on his mission. So then we show up, there is a confidence. You understand this. Those who are in military understand this. This tells us a lot of things. Number one, we could stand in front of him unconfident and ashamed. Right? Don't be that person. I will be standing there alongside you in honor of the one who is our superior, in a sense, officer. He's many things. And one that he is is the captain of the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the general of God's army, so to speak. And we will be there, and I want, if I can use this terminology, this company to be ready, right? We served, we continued, we follow, we did, we sacrificed, and now we're here reporting for inspection, right? John says, hey, 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 when he comes... There will be a checking in of sort. There will be a standing in front of him, both collectively and, of course, individually. So in order for us on that day to be confident, 
confident in front of him, granted, we'll get into this, our salvation is based on his righteousness, not our own, but we have a responsibility to follow him. We continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him when he returns. John wants us to have this concept squarely in our mind eye. That there would be a day of reckoning, of reporting in. There's a day in which the battle will be over. And those who served and followed after him now are there to receive their commendation. Let us be people who continue to fulfill our assignment, continuing to honor our mission, and continuing to honor the one who sent us. You know you're a representative of Jesus Christ. Do you not know that? If you indeed are a child of God, then you represent God. Granted, we do um, not always do it well, and John gets into this, but our heart should be that this is our desire, this is our trajectory, this is what we are living to do, is honor Him. So John says, continue to do what is right. Continue to be in Him. Continue in Him. Second, this is where he talks about continue to do what is right. This is verse 29. 29. So he tells us this thing, and then he goes this if statement. Now, if you know that He, which is God, is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. Okay? So if you know, if you know God and you know that he is righteous, then you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Which means if you are connected to God, you will know that he is righteous. If you know him, you understand his characters, characteristics. And one of his characteristics is, is that he is righteous. And because he is righteous... And we are connected to him. We do what is right according to his character and his word because we have been born of him. Okay? So because he is righteous, we who are born of him as his children do what is right. So our living or our right living is the evidence that we are children of the righteous one. And we know how this works in our physical body, right? If I had my two daughters up here, and you looked at me, especially my wife, and we, you looked at them, you say, hmm, yeah, they're Dave's daughters. If I put ten young ladies up here, right, and we sat down here, you could probably pick out which ones are our daughters because they look like us. <laughs> Thankfully, more like their mother than their dad. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Amen, right? <laughs> like, like mother, like daughter, like father, like son, not just physically, but often characteristically. This is the concept here, right? If <laughs> you are born again, right? If you are born anew, if you are born of the Father, because He is righteous, then you will do what is right. Our rightness comes out of his righteousness. Do you understand that, right? Right. He gives us a new nature. He gives us a new desire. He gives us a new heart. And then he tells us to follow after him. And because he's righteous, then those who are born of him continue to do right. Now, he'll say some more stuff here, right? but we have to get our minds around this. Right? Unfortunately, it is so tragic that in our society, we have lowered the bar of what it means to be a Christian to like dirt level. Hear me, right? Oh, you just say a prayer, or you attend church sometime, or you give, you know, $10, right? You're a Christian. Yay, I'm a Christian. 
There's people in this country that, that, and this is why I say I'm, so, I'm more concerned about people who aren't here, that think they're a Christian because they know the message of Jesus. But they're not following him. They're not reading his word. They're not understanding his heart. They're not doing what's right. They're not meeting with the body of believers. Now, do those things make you a Christian? No. What, no, what makes you a Christian? Believing in Jesus, the righteous one. But if you are a Christian, born of God, and you say you know him, then you will do what is right. Do you understand this? And so if you're not doing this, then you're not this. Okay? Now, that should rattle you a little bit, right? And if you know it, you're like, amen to that. But we have to come to terms <laughs> with what Scripture tells us. If you're not continuing in him, then you're not born of him. If you're not doing what's right, then you're not having eternal life. This isn't works righteousness as in we earn it. It's just evidence of what we are. Does this make sense to you? So John is hitting us squarely with this. And then talking about this identity and argue is right five times in this passage it talks about us being children of God and because we're children of God therefore we will look or act a certain way John drills down heavy in this and this is important for us underline it circle it continue to live from your identity from your identity understand what it means to be a child of God so here's John I imagine so excitingly and you see these exclamation points but I think are rightly so he says this thing continue to stay in him continue to do what right and he says okay hey let me remind you see what great love the father has lavished on us and the Greek is like behold what manner of love this is. We can't even comprehend it. And they, they translate it. I think it's a good translation. Understand, see, know the great love of God that he just lavished it on us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were rebelling against him and resisting him and living in sin. And this is our nature, right? God in his great love, he lavished it on us that we should be called children of God. It's scandalous. The pure, righteous, holy, perfect God of the universe adopts us into his family, not only adopts us into his family, but recreates us by being born again so we are part of his family. What kind of love is this? And I hope it blows your mind that God loves you. I hope that blows your mind, right? And John is saying, hey, 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 you see this great love? We're called children of God, and that's what we are. Are. I can say here, you're a child of God. 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 Your primary identity is that of being a child of God. Your identity that matters most is if you're a child of God. I would love it if someone came up to you, hey, tell us a little bit of yourself. I'm a child of God, first and foremost, who happens to live in America, married to this person, so on, so on, so on. If your identity is in something other than being a child of God, it is misplaced. Let that sink in. Well, I don't feel worthy. Here's the good news. You aren't. (laughs) 
but, but he is worthy and he chose you. <gasps> that should be like, oh, what? It means you have an inheritance. That means you have a purpose. That means you're going to live forever. All of us in this room, a hundred years from now, will not be in this room. We will be in eternity. John says, hey, grasp it. Understand you're a child of God. And, and, and sometimes we just get so defeated and so deflated and so depressed. Right? I'm nothing. I'm nobody. Are you a child of God? Then you are. So stop it. I'm lovingly saying that. Stop believing stuff that isn't true. This is what you are. And if this is what you are, John is basically saying, then act like it. Live like it. Understand, behold, see, know. Know the great love of God the Father, right? Poured it on you, right? You're a child of God. This is what we are, right? This is incredible. And then John goes on to say, okay, here's a contrast. Those outside, those in the world, right? The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Now, dear friends, now we are children of God. And check this out. And what we will be has not yet been made known. You don't even know how good it's going to be to be called a child of God yet. Just you wait when the glory of God is revealed. We don't even know, but what we know is unbelievable. But what we do know is that when Christ appears, there it is again, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Colossians talks about Jesus being the firstborn over all creation. That is, the one who is born first or resurrected first. Jesus was eternal, but he was resurrected first. He's the first one. And so we're going to know, uh, we know a little bit, we're going to be like Jesus. So if you look at the post-resurrected Jesus before his ascension, we're going to be like that, right? Just mind-blowing. We just know just a little bit. Right? We'll see him as he is. So John is urging us, listen, live from your identity. Understand who, and again, whose you are. Now I've hit it, and I'm going to hit it again, right? You don't have eternal life because of your goodness. Understand this. We're not trying to earn salvation. You're not trying to be good enough so when you get to the doors of the pearly gates, hi, I'm here, let me in, I'm awesome, I deserve this. Not going to happen. Oh, like what if you're like super good, right? Like you're a great grandma good if you have a good great grandma, right? She's evil, use a different illustration. Really good. What if you're really good? Can you earn salvation? Oh, this is music to my ears. My pastoral ears are so happy. I cannot. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have gone astray. Gone astray. No one is righteous. No, not one. Hello, Romans, right? It's grace you have been saved through faith. Not that it's of your own, not that it's by our works, it's because of Jesus Christ. Right? So we're in Him, we're made new in Him, 
And then we follow after him as evidence of our salvation, not to earn it. This part is the foundation, what Christ did for us. The part of living it out is the evidence that you are living from this reality. You understand this. This is important. This is important. As in living for him. And living as a child of God because it proves that we are in Him. And this is what John is just getting at and drilling down in. And like, understand your identity. We're going to be like Him. The great love of God. Let this be absorbed into your soul. And John continues in verse 3. This is our next point. Continue to purify yourself. So all who have this hope in him purify themselves. Why? Just as he is pure. Number one, Christ is pure. And we say, amen. Because if Christ wasn't pure, then he died for his own sins and we're all in trouble. Christ is pure. And so if we are born of God, and if we are brothers and sisters to Christ, then we need to strive for that righteousness. Well, how can we do that? Okay? Well, look at this. All who have this hope, hope in Christ, purify themselves. So that tells me that we have a responsibility in this, and this is a continual action Verb. Okay. So, what is our part in being purified? Or the word is forgiven of sin. Guess what our part is? Confess it. Thank you. Someone's read, read. Okay. Confess your sin. Own and confess. Here's the good news He's faithful and just and forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So our responsibility when we trespass, get off the path, do something that is not on mission or not honoring to God, those who are of God then have a responsibility as good children to loving parents say, hey, dad, mom, I messed up. Now God will not pummel you for this, right? Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? How did they respond? What did they do? They hid. Right? It's a little too close. You're like, dude, you're getting a little too close to me. <laughs> they hid. Right? That's our tendency. You have children, you understand this, right? You're a child, you understand this. Right? Yeah, I'm just going to put that behind the bed. Right? If you understand God's love for you, when you sin, you won't hide from him, you'll run to him. Because he can get the hooks out. He can heal the wounds. He can help us go in the right way because he understands we're children. Children fail at times. Well, I'm 96 year old. You're still a child compared to God. If you understand God's heart, then you run to him Kind of messed up, screwed up. This is what we do, and we come to Him, and He then ongoingly purifies us. And we do it because we are a relative, so to speak, a brother of Jesus. He is pure, and when we get to heaven, all that we're doing. All that God's doing is looking for family resemblance. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Jenny, she looks like Jesus. (laughs) Not that she's like a Jewish dude, right? (laughs) I see his character in him. She gets up early and sacrifices and leads choirs and takes care of her husband who is in the hospital. right? And loves people and continues... To strive after him. That's what he's looking for in all of us. 
All who have this hope in him purify ourselves, purify themselves. Okay, so this is what people born of God do, just as he is pure. Now he continues, and this is the next one, continue to fight sin, right? Now he's dealing with sin, right? He's like, okay, we have to continue in him. We have to do what's right. We sin, we have to purify ourselves, so let's talk about sin, right? And this is what he says in verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. Okay, this is what sin is, breaking the law. What law? Laws of God, like embodied in the great commandment, love the Lord your God, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, embodied in the Ten Commandments, these things. All who sins break the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And you could say, amen to that. That's why he came, to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Now, verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. It should just like suck the the, the air out of your lungs. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. This should freak you out a little bit. He says it again in verse 9. Why should it freak you out? Because your experience isn't like this. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. I have been following Jesus since I was 17. I'm 50 whatever. I'm 50, okay? I still sin. I know it's a shock. (laughs) My wife was here. She'd be laughing. So how do I reconcile my reality of sinning? That is, sins of commission, things I do, sins of omission. The right things I know to do that I don't do. How do you reconcile the reality of our lives with no one who lives in him keeps on sinning? No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. In verse 9, I'm going to read this for us. It says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. What? Because God's seed remains in them, they cannot go on sinning. Why? Because they have been born of God. So what does this mean? Are Christians to reach a state of sinless perfection in this world and some by the way teach this right that you can live so righteously that you will never sin good luck with that okay. <laughs> i hope you strive for it right i'm not saying well don't try i'm not saying that but wow so so, so what does it mean? All right. So in order to understand this, we got to understand a couple other things, right? There's good teachers out there. I read some quotes by a, a preacher and a theologian called John Piper. They're in here, okay? So this helps us, okay? So I'm going to read this word for word. So, so here's why John is not teaching sinless per, uh, perfection, okay? The first and the most obvious reason is this, is... What he says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, and verse 10. This is what's written there. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay, That's what it says right there in the beginning of 1 John. So John goes so far as to tell Christians... That it is a sin to say you're sinless. Okay, you understand that? Right? So we can't say we're sinless, right? That's the first thing here. Now, the second reason, and the Greek geeks among us will understand this, is that the Greek ver- verb commit sin or sin in verse 9, okay, down a little bit, implies continuous action. It will be well translated this way. No one born of God is content to keep 
sinning. For God's seed abides in him. And he cannot be content to keep on sinning because he is born of God. Does this make sense now? Right? Right? I want you to be convicted of sin. If you are saying, well, I'm sinning, I know I'm sinning, and I'm going to keep doing it. Right? That should send some alarm bells to you. Right? Now, is there persistent sins? You can say, yes, pick your poison here. Right? There's lots from greed or lying or gossiping or lusting or anger or whatever. Right? It's a lot. And our flesh is bent a certain way, but are you fighting against it? I hope you don't feel good when you sin. Why? Because it's killing you. You are either destroying sin or sin is destroying you. We're in a battle. And our battle isn't against flesh and blood, y'all. Right? It's against the sin within and the perpetrators of trying to accuse us or trap us, right? tempt us or shame us. This is an active battle. And so we are in Christ and he changes us and we look to follow him and there's got to be some type of change happening. If you say, I'm a Christian and nothing changes, you're not. That's what it says. Don't be deceived. You say, God, I need your spirit. I can't, right? I remembered I tried to stop sinning because I hated it. This was before I was a Christian. God was convicting me, right? Convicting me as a 16-year-old. And it's like, Paul, I couldn't do, I, why do I always do what I don't want to do? I hate this. Conviction. God, I need your grace. And it compels us to run towards him, to give us a new desire so that we can do these things. And so we continue to strive to fight against sin. And if you are not fighting against it, then you're not born of God. That's a strong statement, but that's the truth. Don't deceive yourself. Help me to live in a way that follows after you. This is what walking in the light means. If we're walking with God, we realize our sin, we confess it, which is purifying ourselves, and we look not to continue to do the same thing. But if we do the same thing, we go back to the light, we, we confess it, He helps us, we keep moving forward. But we're continuing in this process to become more and more like Jesus. And just like Tom was saying last week, the, bar, your, the graph of your life might look like this as you're following Jesus, but come on, let's be you know, more like Christ 10 years from now than we are now, let's continue moving in that direction. Fight, live, do this. And John ends with this. Okay. Continue to demonstrate your faith. And here are these words here in verse 7. Dear children, dear children, dear children. Why do you think John is calling this so many times so you would get it, you're a child of God. Dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. <laughs> Don't let these voices lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous. <laughs> Just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. <laughs> ah, verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin content with this because God's seed remains in them, born of God. They can't go on sinning. 
Because they've been born of God. And John ends this whole section and transitions in what we're going to look at next week. This is how we know who the children of God are. This is what he's driving at this whole level. How do we know? How do we know? This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Two categories. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Litmus test. If you do what's right, according to God's word, according to what it says, you submit yourself to it, it's evidence that you are a child. But if you continue to continue in your sin, you can't say you're a Christian. Because if you know him and if it seeds in you, then you'll be like him. And he is righteous. And because he is righteous, we're going to do what's right. So if you're not doing what's right, you're not a child of God. End of discussion. Well, don't judge me. I'm not. His word is. And we have to recognize what's true. Don't deceive yourself. Don't be deceived about others who say they are a Christian. I'm like, and what does that mean? Well, I'm still, you know, sleeping around with my girlfriend. I'm still not reading the Word. I'm still not going to church. But I believe in Jesus. Do you? Do you? I hope that breaks your heart. How many people, how many people, we just took a microphone and went down to the mall or <laughs> over to the casino. Okay. Hey, are you a Christian? No, please God, I'm a Christian. When's the last time I've been to church? Well, those people are bad. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm a Christian. Hey. Great. Quote me a Bible verse. <laughs> we at least got one Christian in here. <laughs> you, you, are, you, are you guys understanding this? Are you understanding this? Right? If there's not evidence, then you're not. This is what it's saying. And he makes it just like keep reading this book. It's like, it's there. I'm giving you these things all the time. It's here. <laughs> if you don't do what's right, then you're not. And if you don't love your brother and sister, those in the faith, then you're not. If you say you love God and yet you hate God's children, then you don't love God. Please understand this. So, I'm coming in for a landing. Well, what do we do with this? Right. Like, holy cow, what do we do with this? Okay, just like I said in the beginning, this is the mirror. Take a deep look. Okay, that's what I'm telling all of us to do. Take a deep look. Okay, go home, take the passage, look at it, take the notes if they're going to be helpful for you. All right, how am I doing here? Hmm. I got a little something right here. <laughs> What's that, Dave? Oh, that shouldn't be there. What is it? Well, it's something on me, but it's not in me. No, understand that. Right. Ah, you were a little testy with your wife this morning. Which I was. We had a family emergency that's up. That's why she's not here. Why aren't you going faster? You know what? Hmm. I need to confess that. That is a problem with me. I see it. God, cleanse me from this. And I go make it right with my wife. Sorry I did this. This was not okay. You do that. If we did that, a lot of our relational issues would go away because we often want the other person to look in the mirror and we don't look in it ourselves. Do you hear me? Do that. Look at this, right? Hopefully you're encouraged. 
Hopefully you say yes. Hopefully you say yes, I'm going to continue. Yes, I'm going to serve. Yes, it's going to be all worth it because he is, yes, coming back. He came to forgive me of my sins. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Help me to live in the light. And hopefully you are assured, strengthened, encouraged. But you might be here and you might be looking in the mirror and you're like, hmm. This ain't just skim deep. What is going on? And be honest. Uh, do you really believe in Christ? Okay, then get after it. Talk to Him. Pray to Him. Follow Him. Just take steps. No one does it perfectly, but we get better over time because we know Him. Do that. And then pray for your family and your loved ones. This is where it gets really hard. Because who doesn't want to think that their brothers aren't saved? Well, I said the prayer when I was five. And? You hear it? This is where it gets hard. It means we need to Love them, show the grace of God to them, and tell them the truth. Where are you at, bros, sisters, kids? That's why I said it is a heavy word, but it's also liberating because it's light, illuminating. So, Father, here we are, and we've talked a lot today. God, I know I skipped over some stuff, and here we are. We did our best. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in this congregation. God, I thank you for faithful friends who are striving after you. God, I ask that we would be, what's the word, Um, strengthened, emboldened, um, edified, encouraged, convinced, and we continue to move forward with power and great joy as we run our race on assignment of the one true King. What an amazing grace that is. Help us, God, sustain us to fight the good fight of faith against sin in our own life and to see righteousness and rightness happen in our earth. God, we pray for those who are deceived, who think they're Christians or children of God, but these things aren't true of them. God, we ask that there would be an opening of eyes, God, a telling of truth, Lord, a conviction of sin that leads to righteousness and redemption through grace. We pray for our loved ones. Pray for them, God. We pray for them. May they know the good, irresistible love of God and run to it. We're grateful for our salvation, God. We're grateful for your word. Work in us. so that we would be confident and unashamed in your returning. In Jesus' name, amen.